Hey, come on, see love. Can we give it up for a God who makes all things beautiful? Isn't that great that we have a God who takes broken, messed up situations and things and turns them into something beautiful? Aren't you glad for that? Anybody glad for that? And I want to say welcome to those of you watching online. We're so glad to have you with us today. And we're so thankful for Claire and Juan Morales. If you don't know them, I'm just telling you, they are a gift to the body of Christ and to sea life. And so, um, man, thank you guys for sharing your story. I want to say happy Father's Day to you, all the dads in the room, all the dads watching online. Uh, man, this is a special day. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, man, I, I had a great dad growing up, still a great dad, Love my dad so much and uh, have some great men in the room that have been father figures to me. We have some of the best men in, that I know of right here at Sea Life. And so for all of you, just want to say happy Father's Day to you. And we are on the back end of Serve Week. And uh, Serve Week has been incredible. We had people all over um, our four campuses and the surrounding communities that were serving in the name of Jesus Christ this week. And so that's been awesome to see, hasn't it? Nobody else is like that? Like, I thought it's been awesome. I just want you to know, I thought it's been amazing just to see um, all the posts and just to see the hands and feet of Christ in the community saying to the world around us that, man, we care about you. We know God cares about you. God loves you. And so I want to say thank you to you for serving and for giving to make that possible. We're glad about that. We are on week six, the final week of our series called Beautiful Design. And uh, we've been talking through really the fact that our world has gotten, seems to have gotten off the, off, the, uh, off the railroad track, off the tracks, that's the word I'm looking for, off the rails, there's the, the phrase I'm looking for. And uh, when you go back to the beginning, it helps because we get to see God's intention in design. And we all understand that design matters, right? I mean, I've got, I've got um, some trimmers in my bathroom, and it's like the kind that the barber use. You plug them up, and, you know, they do the bottom of your hair. You know what I'm talking about, guys? You can, I, I shave my beard with it a lot of times. And then I go out in the garage, and I've got um, another trimmer, but it's a weed trimmer. And so it's like a, on a big, long pole. It's got some, some line coming out of it, some plastic line. It's got a big engine on it. And, and I guess I could take that trimmer, Maybe, I don't know, I've never tried it. I could take that trimmer and if I could put an extension cord long enough, I could go out in the yard and I could trim some weeds with it. My, my, I think it would probably work. I think I could probably do that. But it wouldn't be the ideal situation. And if anybody, if I ever go to the barber and he comes at me with a weed trimmer to trim my beard, I'm getting out of there, right? And, and because we, we recognize that that's not what they were designed to do, that design matters. And the reality is we get that in products we use. We, we seem to accept that. Nobody is going to go and, and uh, have a Father's Day outing today. You've got people coming over. Nobody's going to stop by the store and get a bag of ice and go home and put it in your oven, are you? You're going to put it in your freezer because you know that's what it was designed to do. We accept that with products in our life, but I think oftentimes we want to push against that when it comes to the way that we live our lives. We want to say, hey, regardless of, of how it was designed to work, regardless of how the designer, the creator made this life to work, I want to live it the way I want to live it. And when we do, we will not thrive because we're, we're pushing against the design that God has for our life. And so we talked about it in creation. We talked about it in humanity that you and I were created with Imago Dei, the image of God stamped on our life. And so that sets humanity, that sets men and women above all the rest of creation. We talked about it when it comes to the way God created men and women specifically, that they're equal in value, in dignity, in worth, in ability, but that God seems to have placed from the, the beginning, from the very beginning, a different and unique function for men and women. There's a design issue that we ought to strive to live out. We talked about it in our sexuality, and then today I want to talk about it in our relationships. We're looking specifically at the marriage relationship and how God has designed it to work. Now, I want to say a word to those of you in the room and those of you watching online that maybe um, aren't in a marriage relationship right now, and I, I want to just encourage you to pay attention for a couple of reasons. One, maybe one day you will be in a marriage relationship, and this would be really useful information for you. Or maybe you know people in a marriage relationship that um, from time to time need some counsel, and you need to have an understanding of how God made it to work. And that's the human condition. The human condition is that we want to 
live life and do life the way we want, and, and, and our desire is that we would get the results that we want, but the result is that that's not the way life works, and we end up in broken relationships and relationships that aren't what they should be. And let's just be honest about it. Marriage can be difficult, right? We're all on the same page there. It's okay to nod your head, okay? It, we, all, we all understand that marriage can be difficult. I do um, some weddings from time to time, and, and I always laugh at the young couple, you know, walking out of the, the, the wedding venue that night, and they're arm in arm, and it's like, oh, this is going to be amazing, and, and it is going to be amazing, but it's not going to always be amazing, you know, and they're walking out, and they're, oh, we're just going to love each other, and they're looking at each other with these googly eyes, and she's so perfect, and he never does anything wrong, and I'm like, yeah, give that a few months. I don't even think you're married until one of you have prayed that the Lord would take the other one out, you know? <laughs> it's not really a marriage until that's happened. It's about four, you have to be about four years in before you're really married. You're not even married yet, if, if that's the way you feel. And in fact, you see the flood of high profile divorces. Doesn't that raise concern? I mean, you, you know, a few months ago we saw Jeff Bezos, who I think at the time was the, the wealthiest man in the world, and his wife were getting a divorce. Like, how are y'all getting a divorce? You're not even living a normal life. Like, you're, you can do whatever you want, when you want. You're the richest people in the world. How can you not make it work? And then a few months later, you see Bill Gates and his wife getting, getting a divorce. And you're like, it's still, you know, and so the richest people can't necessarily make it work. It's not uncommon to see high-profile pastors having affairs, getting divorced. And so you're like, the rich can't make it work. The religious can't make it work. Is there any hope for you and I? Is there any hope for just normal, everyday people to be able to make it work? And I, I would hope that today, even though it feels like the odds are stacked against a, help, uh, a happy marriage, I would hope that today you would leave this time with some hope, with some fresh hope, that if we, if we will submit to God's design, we can have a better relationship. And I want us to look in Genesis chapter two, and we're gonna start back when, when God first created man and woman, and look at the design, and look at how it's supposed to work. In Genesis chapter two, starting in verse 21, it says, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of a man. Now that's what you call love at first sight, isn't it? I mean, that, that's love at first sight. God brings the woman to, the, to Adam and, and he spontaneously erupts into a poem. That's love at first sight, ladies. If your man spontaneously erupts into a poem, that's love at first sight. Men, I mean, I, maybe some men do. I'm not a, very much of a poet. All my poems start out with roses are red, and so I'm impressed with Adam right there. It goes on in verse 24, it says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Can I get an amen? <laughs> and this is the beauty of marriage, isn't it? God creates two people. God creates one man and one woman, and they, they come together together. One man, one woman, two different people, they come together and God makes the two one. God, God makes two unique, separate people one. Two people on the same team, different gifting, different roles, walking perfectly in step, and that's what God created marriage to be. Unfortunately, the ideal only lasted for one chapter. The ideal only goes for one chapter. In the very next chapter, we see things turned completely upside down. Very next chapter, chapter three of Genesis, the serpent says to, says to Eve, did God really say you cannot eat from any tree? And Eve responds, no, just can't eat from this one tree or we will die. 
And the serpent says, you will not die. You will be like the big guy, and he doesn't want that. And Eve was intrigued and thought, what the hey? And look at the next line in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. And she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And I'm like, wait a second. Wait a second. I mean, I always thought when, when Eve ate the fruit that Adam was off river rafting somewhere. You know, that Adam was, maybe he was working, he was chopping down trees. He, he was, you know, building a hall. He was, you know, got, had some kind of DIY project going on in their house. Adam was doing something, but what we see is that's not reality. The reality is that Adam was right there beside Eve when the serpent came and gave her the fruit. What, what was he doing? We, we look into this passage and Adam's family is under spiritual attack and he just leaves Eve to handle it on her own. And thousands of years later, this is still the primary downfall of so many men in our society. The, the word is, or the phrase is male passivity. It's the primary downfall of men in our society, male passivity. It shows up in two primary areas that I wanna talk to you about. We, we touched on this a little bit a few weeks ago. But male passivity shows up in the spiritual leadership of the family. Too often, women are engaged in the spiritual battles at the home or in the home, and the man is nowhere to be found. Genesis, in Genesis, uh, God calls Abraham to be the father of many nations. And if you look back, I think it's Genesis 30. If you look back in Genesis 30, um, God's talking to Abraham and he tells Abraham, hey, and you're gonna disciple your children. You're gonna teach your children. And he gives Abraham this long kind of um, list of commands on teaching his children and discipling his children. And, and I, I read that and I'm like, man, that's ironic, isn't it? That he didn't give that to Abraham's wife. And I think far too often we, we decide, men, that the discipling of the children is our wives' job. But that's not the way it was in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, it kept saying, and teach your sons, and teach your sons, and teach your sons, and teach your sons the ways of God, and teach your sons the way God operates. And that wasn't because the daughters were not important. That was because the expectation was that you'll pass it on to your son, and they will pass it on to their family, and they will pass it on to their sons, and their sons will pass it on. It was because that was God's model for how the discipleship was supposed to work in the Old Testament. And too many times, it's the women who are teaching and praying, and the men are spectators in the homes. And that's not the way it's supposed to be. And I don't know whether it's the result of laziness or insecurity or maybe a combination of both, but that doesn't, um, e either one of those doesn't give you the opportunity to slough off your, your responsibility as the primary spiritual leader in your home. And I just want to tell you today, men, don't be deceived about this. Listen, listen to me. Do not be deceived about this. Your family is under spiritual attack. Every single day, your family is under spiritual attack. Now, I know a lot of men who seem to want to be prepared for every kind of physical attack there could possibly be. Like they're lifting heavy, heavy things. They're, they're making sure they're in great shape. So, so if somebody ever, you know, comes up and pushes your wife, you're ready to defend her. You've got weapons in your home, like all kinds of weapons. You've got like a, enough weapons that if a small militia was to come attacking your family at night, you feel like you could defend yourself. You've got them by your bed, a biometric safe that you can open in 0.6 seconds. Baseball bats head, you know, hidden around every corner under the bed so that if there's ever a physical attack, you are ready. Anybody know anybody like that? <laughs> Amen, we got. That only in Texas. <laughs> I'm with you on that one. You're, you're so prepared for a physical attack that will probably never come when there's a spiritual attack happening every single day on your family. It's our responsibility, men, to, to make sure that we take on the, the mantle of leadership, spiritual leadership for your family. You're responsible before God for that. How do I, how do I know this? 
How do I know this? Who was it that ate first from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Who was it that ate first? It was Eve, right? We all remember that? It was Eve that ate first from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And yet, look at what it says in Romans. Romans chapter five, verses 12 through 14. It says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet, stay with me here, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. And if you're Adam, aren't you like, wait a second, God, she did it first. That's actually what he said. It was her fault. And yet God, in Romans, in his word, he says, no, listen, here's who's responsible. Bible doesn't say, hey, sin came to us through one woman. It puts the responsibility on Adam. And you're like, that seems unfair, and it's not unfair. Because God made Adam to be the head, which means he's responsible and rightfully held accountable. And men, we're, we're responsible for the spiritual leadership of our homes. Now, I want to just give you a disclaimer. I think we've done this a couple of times. But to make sure you hear this, in homes where the man is not present, I want you to remember that where where the ideal is lacking, God's grace abounds. So single moms, hear that today. This is not a a, a condemnation of you as a single mom. We're saying where, where the ideal is lacking, God's grace abounds. And I can name you man after man that I know of and some that I know personally that grew up in homes without a, a dad that have turned out to be incredible spiritual men. But the ideal, the way we were designed is for the man to be the spiritual leader. The second place where we most commonly see male passivity is in his pursuit of his wife. Now, men, we're hunters, right? I mean, some of y'all are hunters. I'm not really a hunter. Some of y'all, I, I gotta just say, this is probably the best time for me to say this. I don't even consider what you do hunting. It's like you're operating a zoo. It's like you go out for months and, and put out a buffet for animals to come up and partake. You know, you put corn out and you put feed out. I don't know what y'all put out, whatever you put out there. It's like a little mini buffet every night for the, for the deer to come up. And then you get about 100 yards away with a high-powered weapon and a scope in the safety of a little mini cabin with a heater. And you call that hunting. That does not impress us. You want to impress me? Strip down naked. Chase it down with your bare feet and gnaw it to death, okay? (laughs) Then I'll feel like you've accomplished something. But but we're hunters, right? And remember, listen, by nature, we're hunters. We love the pursuit. And and you know how you know how y'all fell in love? There was a pursuit. There was a pursuit. You you were like, man, I'm gonna bring flowers, I'm gonna buy gifts, I'm gonna invite you out on dates, and we're gonna go to dinners. And I'm gonna text you or call you. Remember guys, anybody in here remember falling asleep on the phone? Some of you are like, don't wanna admit it. You're like, it never happened with me either. I'm just saying I've heard of that happening, right? Like you, you were pursuing and then what happens? You get married and the pursuit stops. Like, hey, let's don't, let's don't go out to eat. Let's don't go, let's don't go to a show. Why don't we watch Netflix? It's like, why don't, I don't really want to watch that show. Why don't you watch that show and I'll watch my show in my room? And some of you wives are like, that's actually better. Thank you. <laughs> right? Where, where's the pursuit? It's, it's, it's male passivity. Love what it says in Proverbs chapter or I'm sorry, Psalm chapter 128, verse three, it says that our wives should be a fruitful vine or a well-watered vine within the house. If your marriage has shriveled up, maybe it's because you're not nurturing it. You, You stopped watering. You stopped pursuing. It's male passivity. I mean, I'm gonna give you a rest just for a minute. You can take a little breather, okay? I wanna turn our attention to the women for just a minute because this passage also puts a spotlight on what is 
commonly the downfall of women. It's female dominance. So where Adam was passive, Eve really didn't even seem to mind one bit, did she? She just stepped right into the role of head and decided to take it upon herself to, to eat the apple. There was no, hey, Adam, should we, should we do this? What do you think? There was no consulting back and forth. It was just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this on my own. Now, what do I mean by female dominance and how does it show up? It looks like the undermining of his authority. It looks like bypassing him in the decision-making process. It looks like a critical spirit. It looks like becoming an expert in his faults and not his strengths. Can I, can I just tell you, women, something? And this is really true for men, too. It takes no character to find the fault in others. It does not require character. That's not a spiritual gift to find the fault in other people. And listen, women, here's how dominance begins to look for women. It begins to look like a critical spirit oftentimes. You're never gonna, you're never gonna criticize your husband into becoming the man that you want him to be. It will not happen. The only way that you're gonna ever get your husband to become or you're, you're gonna help your husband to become the man that you know that God wants him to be is through encouragement, is through to continue to raise the bar, to continue to see the best in him and allow him to aspire to it. You will never criticize your husband into becoming the man that you want him to be. And I know some of your women are like, but oh, I'm just, I just like to remind him of things. I just, I just like to remind him you know what reminding sounds like to a man? I'm not going to say the word, but it starts with an N and rhymes with agging, okay? That's what it sounds like to a man. And so, so I'm just telling you, um, some of you, listen, some of you ladies, you have a critical spirit. You have a critical spirit. And you need to repent of it. You need, to, you need to repent of it. You need to confess it and repent and change your mind and stop doing it. Listen to what it says in Proverbs. This, this verse, I love this verse. It says, it is better to live in a corner of the housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. Men do not amen on that. It's better, listen, ladies, do you hear that? It's your husband would be better off to get a sleeping bag, climb up on the roof and live there than to live with a wife with a quarrelsome spirit or a critical spirit. It's female dominance. And some of you need to repent of it. And that was the recipe for the very first sin of humanity, male passivity and female dominance. And just like that, just like that, paradise was lost in the relationship. And God addresses the serpent, Adam and Eve, and reveals what the fallout of their sin would be. Listen to what it says in, in verse 14. It says, and the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and your woman, or in the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Talking to the serpent, God was. And to the woman, God said, and I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And one commentary explained that line this way. After the fall, after the fall, the husband no longer rules easily. After the fall, after sin came into the world and sin came into you and me, the relationship was messed up and it's no longer easy. And, and we all get that, right? We all understand that marriage is no longer easy. I'm just telling you, marriage is difficult. I'm married way over my head. I do not need an amen on that. I, I know it. I, I recognize that. But you know what I also married? I married a very strong person. 
And, and so we're, we're both incredibly competitive, like super competitive. And so we can get into an argument. We've been married for 28 years now. We can get into arguments and we can have some kind of issue that we're arguing over. And pretty soon we're not arguing about the issue. We're arguing to win the argument. Like, I don't even remember what the issue was. The issue is not even important. And you know what, what I would tell you, and my wife would say this if she was standing here. Because of what I do for a living and probably some gifting and spiritual gifting and all that kind of stuff, I'm better at arguing than she is. And so I can, I can be wrong and win the argument. And, and, and what I've realized is that that is not good. That does not bring our marriage to a better spot. In fact, let me, let me just, one of my favorite jokes. Y'all look like y'all need to be a little happier in this room. Y'all happy? Some of you need to tell your face, okay? Um, but, but here's the reality, listen. Here's, um, so here's the joke. This is one of my favorite jokes. This, this lawyer, this high-powered Los Angeles attorney, about 35, 40 years old, he comes down to Texas and he's in West Texas and he's bird hunting. And he shoots a bird and, and the bird falls and he sees it fall in the distance and he goes to go pick up his bird and as he's, as he's going to get his bird, he comes to a little fence and it's a barbed wire fence and he, and he starts to you know, separate the fence and go between the fence to go get his bird. And as he does, an, an old 70-year-old um, farmer comes riding up on his tractor and he says, excuse me, sir, what are you doing? And the young attorney says, well, I, I shot a bird. I'm going to get my bird. And the the, the old farmer says, well, no, sir, that's my property. You can't, can't go on my property. And the, the young attorney said, well, that's my bird. I'm going to get my bird. And the farmer says, no, you're not going to get your bird. That's my property. The, the attorney says, well, I'm, I'm an attorney. I'll sue you if you don't let me go get my bird. And the old farmer says, well, that's not how we settle things here in Texas. We don't sue people. That's not how we do it. We, we use the three-kick method. And the attorney said, well, what's the three-kick method? I've never heard of it. And the old farmer says, well, we, we take turns kicking each other three times until one of us gives up. And the, the young attorney, you know, he's in good shape. He looks at this old farmer that looks like he can barely move and says, okay, you know, I can, I can take this guy. I can outkick this guy. And he says, okay, I'll do it. And the farmer calms down off of his tractor, kicks the guy right in the leg as hard as he can. The, the attorney falls down a little bit and kind of, you know, grasps his knee. And then the then the attorney, or then the farmer kicks the guy right in a bad spot, like a really bad spot, and the, the attorney like doubles over, and the old farmer takes his boot and just right up the, you know, right in the face, kicks him across the nose, and the attorney falls over and kind of rolls over, bleeding now, and he gets up and he says, okay, my turn, and the old farmer says, no, sir, that's okay, go get your bird. And you know, there's a point to that. And it's that you can win and still lose. You, you can win and still lose. And I'm just telling you, marriage is hard. And what I had to learn along the way is in the competitiveness of it, I could win the argument and still lose. And the reality for all of our marriages in this room, for everybody's marriage watching online, is that marriage is difficult. And there's some area that for you, you go, man, this, this is not as easy as everybody made it sound like it was going to be. This is not as easy as it was supposed to be. And, and it's difficult because doing marriage in this fallen world is always going to be a struggle, the Bible teaches us. Now that sin has entered the world, now that sin is in you, marriage is going to be difficult at times. And the reality is that when we understand that and expect that, we also should begin to understand that through the power of God, it, we, we can live it in a better way. And I, I know you're going, well, that, this is a heartwarming sermon on Father's Day, Pastor. Good news, it's going to always be a struggle. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Hoping, that's the message I was hoping to hear. And I'm, I'm telling you this, listen, while it's always going to be a struggle, you can be victorious. Let me give you three action points real quick. Three action points and we'll be done. If you want to make your marriage better, if you want to go back to the design and live it out the way God intended you to do, the first, first action point is this, focus on you. Focus on you. Most of the time when, when we're dealing with couples in, in distress, 
People come and they, they want to talk about everything their spouse is doing wrong. That's almost always how counseling begins. Is let's go to counseling so we can talk about what you do wrong. Okay, I'm ready to go to counseling because I've got some stuff to say about what you do wrong. Okay, let's go. And it's going to be a battle to see who can convince the counselor of who's doing more wrong. And generally, oftentimes, and this is true not just in marriages, by the way, this works across all relationships. When I'm in these settings, I, I have this little exercise I like to do, and I say, okay, you're here, and oftentimes it's with one person. And they're, they're wanting to talk about their spouse and everything they do wrong, and so I'll do this, and sometimes this is on a napkin at a restaurant, but I'll draw a circle like this, and I'll say, okay, if this is your struggle, if this circle is y'all's struggle, then let me ask you a question. This is all the stuff that's wrong in your relationship. What part of it is your fault? I've never one time got above 50% on that answer. Nobody's ever said, about 75% probably. It's it's never above 75, never above 50%. I'll say, you know, surely we recognize, I mean, everybody in here would recognize, like, nobody doesn't, think that they do anything wrong. So, so what percentage? And they'll say, well, you know, I don't know, maybe, maybe 12%. So, okay, okay, let's, let's, there's 12%. That's about 12%, isn't it? Think 12.5%. That's, that's your percentage. And so this is, this is your percentage. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to focus all your attention on that right there. Focus all your attention on the 12% that's your fault, on the 5% that's your fault, on the the 35%, 50%, 75%, whatever percentage is yours, focus all your attention on that part. I'm telling you, your marriages will get 50% better immediately if you just do that. If you just say, hey, I'm gonna be focused on what's my part of the struggle, it'll get better instantly. And the reality is that so many people are going, well, I just married the wrong person. I just married the, you know, I just didn't marry the right person. And go, no, no, the marriage is not about marrying the right person. It's about becoming the right person. And sometimes you make the, deci- the right decision and sometimes you make the decision right. And if you'll just say, hey, I'm gonna focus on me, things will get better qu- quickly. The second thing is this, whoa, I'm getting attacked by beast. The second thing, I'm not a hunter, you can tell. Um, it's a beast. The second thing is this, put in the work. Put in the work. Can I just tell you something? Great marriages are a result of great effort. I mean, that, guys, listen, you need to go back to that day when you were, when you were pursuing your spouse. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna work hard at this. I'm, I'm gonna, guys, you can go to dinner, you can wear a shirt that doesn't have words on it. <laughs> Ladies, you might wanna shave your legs. <laughs> you know, like, it's like, hey, I'm gonna put a little effort into this. I'm gonna invest in the relationship. What does that look like? That might look like marriage counseling. Doesn't mean that you're about to get a divorce. It means, hey, we're at a seven and we need to go to an eight or a nine. How can we do that? We need some help. We need some outside perspective. We're gonna see a counselor. We're gonna establish a date night and say, this is a priority. We put it on the calendar. It comes before the Maverick game. The Maverick's still a thing, firing everybody. It, it comes before, they've got, still got Luca. Okay, but anyway, that's a, that's a side note. That's not a part of the sermon. But it, it comes before everything. We got a date night. We're going on a marriage retreat. I'm gonna start pursuing you again. There's work that goes into it. And then the third thing, and this is the most important one, is that you fix your eyes on Jesus. You fix your eyes on Jesus, and this is huge. I skipped right over this in Genesis chapter three, verse 15. God said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. It means y'all are gonna be enemies. Y'all are gonna battle it out. Gonna be an epic struggle between Satan and humanity for the rest of man's days. But look at what he says. 
but he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel, talking to the serpent. I love this, it's a little Easter egg of the gospel right here. It's talking about how do you kill a snake? You, you stomp on it, right? You stomp on its head. And, and, and what, what he's saying is, listen, serpent, you need to know this. Her offspring, you're, you're gonna bruise his hill. But he's gonna crush your head. Isn't that a picture of what happened with Jesus? That he was bruised but he crushed the enemy. Why, why is that important for us today? Because the only way you're gonna ever have the strength you need to live out the kind of marriage that God has intended for you is the power of Jesus Christ in your life. The only, I'm, I'm telling you, it's too hard for just a normal person to do it. There's, there's only one person who has the power to do the things that are required of a great marriage. There's only one person who, who can empower you to sit in the middle of an argument when, when you want to just fight back, when your pride is, is coming up and swelling up. There's only one, one strength that is strong enough to say, no, just humble yourself right here and apologize. That's the power of Jesus Christ in your life. There is no other, there is no other strength that can empower you to do that. It's only through the power of Christ. And let me tell you what else happens. Look, let's just, let me just see if I can illustrate this for you. If this is Christ, you know, when we're talking about focusing on Christ, if this is Christ and, and man, you're over here, husband, and, and your spouse, your spouse is over here, right here, and y'all are both focused on Christ, what happens as you move, both move toward Christ? What happens from over here as you're moving to, toward Christ and over here your wife is, is taking steps toward Christ and over here your husband is taking steps towards Christ? You notice what's happening? You're getting closer and closer together every move you make towards Jesus Christ. That's the reality of life for a believer is that when you start moving towards Christ, when, when Christ becomes your focus, you'll see a transformation in your life that will empower you to do the things necessary to have the kind of marriage that God designed for you to have. And you'll move closer and closer together as well. Men, stop being passive. Your spouses, your wives need to know that you love them, that they're secure in you. Wives, listen to me, listen to me. Just make eye contact with me for just a minute. Just lean in a second and listen to me. I'm gonna do your husband a big favor right here. He probably won't say this to you, but I promise you it's true. More than anything else in all of the world, he needs to know that you respect him. He probably won't say it to you, if it feels something to say it, but I'm just telling you it's true, 100% true. Every time it's true, more than anything else in all the world, your husband needs to know that he has your respect. It doesn't matter what kind of business he builds. It doesn't matter what kind of leadership position he rises to. It doesn't matter what kind of incredible outings with friends he has or how many season tickets he has to everything in the world. If he doesn't have your respect, it will crush his soul. He needs to know that. So come on, let's start having the kind of marriages that God designed for us to have, the kind of marriages that point people to a God who loves us and redeems us and makes beautiful things out of messes. Aren't that just the kind of marriages we wanna have? I'm gonna ask you to do something in the room. And you can do it online as well. I wanna have a little prayer time. And I know some of you aren't here with your spouses. You can go back and watch it, this online with them if you want. Just have a conversation with them. But if that's you today, and maybe you can be on a wide spectrum here, okay? So there's no, this isn't for people that like, man, we, we were fighting. We, we fought on the way here. We had a knockdown drag out just to get ready to go to church. No, 
This isn't just that. This is like, hey, we, we're at an eight. Like this, our marriage is better than it's ever been, but we want it to be a nine. Or maybe it's we're, and we're hanging on by a thread. Wherever you are on that spectrum is okay. We're not talking about yesterday. We're talking about today and tomorrow. I wanna just encourage you to start brand new right now. Just to, just to put a stake in the ground and say, this is a fresh start. And so I wanna pray over you. And guys, I, I'm gonna just put the, um, put the responsibility on you. And this isn't, you know, maybe you're not comfortable or whatever. And so it's okay if you don't, but if you want, if you want to just, um, there's nothing special about standing up. I know that. But if you want to say today, man, I want, I want to just, to just start fresh today. I want you to just kind of grab your wife's hand and give her, give it a squeeze or whatever. And you just stand up with me. And I want to pray over some couples today that would just say, hey, let's start brand new. And I want to be the man that I know I should be just in this place. Doesn't matter where you are on that spectrum. You wanna say, let's, let's, let's just really focus in on having the kind of marriage and relationship that we know God wants us to have. Our Father, I pray today for these people in this room. God, and I just wanna pray your courage and your grace over them that for some, there's a conversation that needs to be had. There's some things that need to be confessed and repented of. God, for many that um, just need to focus in a fresh way today, saying let's not, let's not just drift in our marriage. Let's be intentional so that we can live this thing the way God designed us to. God, there's some men that need to turn away from passivity in this place today. Start being the spiritual leaders of their home and pursuing their wife. And there's some women today that need to turn away from dominance today, a critical spirit. And I pray that you give us all the grace and the courage to do that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for being here today. You're dismissed. Hope you have a great day.